I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Uh, the guest presenter is one of our colleagues in the Department of Religious Studies, and uh, she will be interrogating what she called exile or migration, and uh, you know, historicizing the the case of the Israelites. Uh, as I read the abstract as well as even the title, I begin to have a laundry of, uh, of questions that I believe she can unravel for me. The fussiness between uh, exile and migration, I believe she will do justice to that. And in terms of forced migration of the Israelites, uh, that in my opinion also led to forced migration or displacement of those that were indigenous to that land. And this idea of continual swearing of the Israel uh, uh, more light into it. Without wasting much time, uh, Dr. DK, you have 30 minutes. So you can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, I've given you co-host right, so you should be able to share the screen. If you're unable to share, and I'm still unable to share, please speak to your paper. Uh, speak to your paper. While you're doing that, I will uh, also turn on the PowerPoint from uh, the, the WhatsApp. I just remember the one that I sent to Telegram did not uh, really open, so I'm going to resend it. So, Dr. DK, you have 30 minutes, man. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. You are welcome to this morning's presentation. The title is Exile on Migration, Ancient Israel's Experience and Its Relevance to Nigeria's Socioeconomic and Political Development. Migration as a global phenomenon has been variously considered from the sociopolitical and economic perspectives with the view of finding how migration can facilitate development and improve opportunities for all. This paper written from the perspective of a biblical scholar examines Israel's, uh, Israel's response to the sociopolitical and identity crisis of the exile. The intention is to engage this experience from a very different historical and cultural setting in a conversation with present day migration challenges towards the development of Nigeria. The term exile is translated from the Hebrew gala, expressing the tra tragedy of Jewish forced migra migration. The biblical exile provides helpful motives from which to develop these thoughts, since these events mirror the experience of migration in many ways. Therefore, it is the objective of this paper to survey ancient Israel's history of, uh, history of exile, evaluate its impact on the sociopolitical and economic development of ancient Israel, appraise contemporary migration challenges in Nigeria, and examine possible lessons from ancient Israel's experience for Nigeria's development. A qualitative research methodology which employs the tool of historical analysis and histogrammatical hermeneutics has been adopted for this work. The purpose is to lend a theological voice to the ongoing discussion on the global phenomena of migration and, its, and uh, as it affects Nigeria's development. The work will invariably add to knowledge in the field of social sciences generally and increase the volume of literature in migration and biblical scholarship. Theoretical and conceptual framework. Migration takes place when people move from one area to another, either nationally or internationally for the purpose of establishing new residence. This paper focuses mainly on the 
historical structural theory of migration and its related models. As a theory, historical structure provided a radically different interpretation of migration paradigm on development. It is traced to the intellectual roots in Marxist political economy and in world systems theory. In current scholarship, historical structural theory is seen as a response to new classical theory, which assumes that labor markets and economies move towards equilibrium in the long run through trade and migration. Migrants here move from societies where labor is abundant and wages are low to societies where labor is scarce and wages are high. According to D. Haas, historical structuralists postulate that economic and political power is equally distributed among developed and underdeveloped countries, that people have unequal access to resources, and that, and that capitalist expansion has this tendency to reinforce these inequalities. Hence, instead of modernizing and gradually progressing towards economic development, underdeveloped countries are trapped by their disadvantaged position within the global uh, geop geopolitical structure. A group of loosely related theoretical models are traceable to the historical structural theory, including the dependency theory, first linked to Adragunda Frank's notion of the development of the underdeveloped, under the development of underdevelopment. Here, instead of a path towards development, the dependency school views migration as detrimental to the economies of the underdeveloped countries, as well as one of the very causes of underdevelopment. This can be explained by the fact that while migration is both from the developed and the underdeveloped countries, yet migration or yet migrants from developed countries come to their hosts on the developed countries as expatriates to tackle technological leadership, scientific education and economic problems. Migration in this case is not born out of joblessness, poor salary, and condition of services as the case with underdeveloped countries. Migration can be voluntary or involuntary. Voluntary migration involves mainly the movement of labor from places of poor economic conditions to seek better economic conditions. By contrast, involuntary or forced migration occurs as a result of war or enslavement. Hence, Paul Tabori defines exile as a person compelled to leave or remain outside his country of origin on account of well-founded fear of persecution or for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. A person who considers his exile temporarily even though it may last eternity, hoping to return to his fatherland when circumstances permit, but unable or unwilling to do so as long as the factors that made him an exile exist. Drawing from Tabori's uh, definition, the term exile refers to a person who has been separated involuntarily from his country of origin, his or her country of origin, as well as to the fact, to the act and state of being separated, the circumstances and period of time of separation. Thus, exile refers to both the person and the condition. Involuntary exiles include those people who live seemingly of their own accord but really because of circumstances beyond their control. The exile is reluctant to leave and only does so when living is only just better than staying. In this study, therefore, exile refers to both forced migration and migrant experiences of ancient Israel. Lim 
has expanded involuntary exile to include the following categories. The first is the derivative forced migration, which results from geopolitical rearrangement. This is mirrored in the conquest of Judea by Babylon in about 597 BC. Geographically, movement was not connoted in this exile. Our geographical movement was not connoted in this exile. Ancient Israel remained in their land, but lost their home due to foreign conquest. Another form is viewed from the post exilic period, when ancient Israel was allowed limited autonomy in their homeland by Persian authorities. The second category is the purposive forced migration, which refers to people being forced to relocate physically at the hands of a dominant power. The event of 587 BC, when Jerusalem was destroyed and Judeans transported to Babylon would fall under this category of migration. The third is the responsive forced migration, which describes people fleeing voluntarily to escape tyranny, oppression, poverty, and other threats to security. Jeremiah's flight to Egypt with a group of Judeans in about 582 BC is an example of this form of migration. The above categorization suggests different experiences of ancient Israel's uh, experience of exile and employs the categories to further distinguish between the various exilic experiences of ancient Israel as follows. The first is Israel's movement into Egypt in the days of Joseph. And second, uh, followed by the, the Old Testament eschatological hope. In this eschatological theory, Isaiah includes every Jew scattered among the nations outside of Israel, beginning with the Assyrian conquest of the Northern Kingdom in the 8th century. The third is the idea of exile, which is represented in 2 Kings 24, that is chapter 24 and 25. This is expressed in Babylon's use of cross deportation, which resulted in mass deportation of Israelites to Babylon. The exile in this picture continues even to the present time since with the Cyrus Edict of Return in about 539 BC, many Jews continue to live outside the Promised Land. This work is situated within the experience of exile pictured in the fall of Jerusalem in about 587 BC and the return in about 539 BC. Reflections on ancient Israel's experience of exile between this period. There are several biblical texts on ancient Israel's exilic experiences, out of which the following five passages have been selected. The first is 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25, which describes the fall of ancient Israel to Babylonian Empire. Babylon was one of the world's most ancient cities and also the center of the Babylonian civilization. And by the late 600 BC, is, it was the dominant power in the, in the Near East. Babylon captured Nineveh, the capital of Assyria around, around 612 BC, and finally defeated her in around 605 BC. This conquest was further extended by Nebuchadnezzar II, whose campaigns led to the fall of Jerusalem in around 587 BC. Consequent upon this conquest, Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim, that was the king of Judea then, prisoner, carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stripped away all the gold objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. King Nebuchadnezzar took all of Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem captive, including the commanders and the best of the soldiers, craftsmen and artisans, 10,000 in all. 
Only the poorest people were left in the land. Nebuchadnezzar led King Jehoiakim away as a captive to Babylon, along with the queen mother, his wives and officials, and all Jerusalem's elites. He also exiled 7,000 of the best troops and 1,000 craftsmen and artisans, all of whom were strong and fit for war. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 24, 12 to 16. What can be garnered from this passage is that King Nebuchadnezzar collected people from the royal class, the elites, able-bodied and best soldiers, craftsmen, artisans, and costly treasure, treasures from the temple, but left the poorest in the land. This way, he stripped Israel of her best brains and robbed her of the needed manpower for redevelopment. Israel's situation fits into the concept of brain drain uh, and uh, West, uh, brain waste saga in Nigeria. Fundamentally, brain drain involves the transfer of knowledge, experience, skill, and expertise from one region, country, or geographic location to another. In the case of brain waste, foreign nationals are, or workers are often hired to do jobs for which hiring country or countries are overqualified. The second passage is Jeremiah 29, one to seven, Jeremiah's letter to the Ezra's. This passage contains a letter believed to have been written by Jeremiah and was sent to Babylon through his friends, encouraging the Ezra's in Babylon to settle down. Jeremiah 29 describes long-term projects by, by the use of the phrases, building houses, planting gardens, and benefiting from the land. Anne believes that the letter instructs Judean exiles to create long-term ethnic enclaves in Babylon. He translates Jeremiah 29.4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the immigrants whom I have sent into forced migration from Jerusalem to Babylon. And in verse seven, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray for the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Place this responsibility on the exile to bless the land. This may include working hard, paying their taxes, uh, acquiring skills, and showing themselves worthy of trust. Rightly viewed, the goal of the letter was to empower the exile to make the most of the exilic uh, situation. The third passage is Daniel chapter six. And Daniel here represents a symbol of Israel's excellence in exile. As an administrator in the Babylonian empire, Daniel distinguished himself as the most capable of all the administrators and maintain high level of integrity. Daniel, as a character among other Jews, shows that the letter written by Jeremiah really impacted positively on the lives of the, um, uh, of the exilic community. The fourth uh, passage is Ezra, uh, Ezra chapter three to six. Here contains the edict or uh, Cyrus edict of return. After conquering Babylon, uh, the Babylonian empire in around 539 BC, King Cyrus II of Persia allowed the exiled peoples, including the Jews, to return to their homelands through an edict commonly described or referred to as edict of return. The returned exile approached the work of rebuilding their homeland as a unified group. They started with the rebuilding of the altar, then the construction of the new temple. However, the wall of Jerusalem remained in ruins until around 545 BC, when it was finally, uh, when it was rebuilt under Nehemiah's leadership, as we can see below. This is the, the fifth passage, Jeremiah chapter one and two. This contains, describes Jeremiah as a symbol of patriotism. Nehemiah was still living in Susa, the capital city of Persia, after King Cyrus' edict. 
as a migrant, he served as cup bearer in the royal court. This is another position of honor and trust taken up by the exile in the foreign land, still indicating that they were truly prepared for the period. The passage reveals Nehemiah's devastation from the news that Jeremiah's war, uh, Jerusalem war had been broken and the people there were living in utter disgrace. He became emotionally attached to the problem, prayed, and then acted by requesting and getting the king's approval to restore the hope of Israel by rebuilding Jerusalem's wall. By rebuilding the wall, a sense of security was restored for both those on the land and those still in diaspora who may wish to come back home. In all, Israel's experience of migration buttresses the assertion that population movements are the carriers of innovation from one region to another. A brief survey of migration in Nigeria and lessons from ancient Israel's experience of exile. Nigeria and ancient Israel are two different nations. This must be acknowledged with their uniqueness. Israel, for instance, was a theocratic nation and mono-ethnic. More so, there were religious connotations to the exilic experiences, which has not been emphasized in this work. Moreover, Israel's exile or migration occasioned by the Babylonian conquest. So it was as a result of a war and defeat. Nonetheless, Nigeria's current experience of migration is very similar to ancient Israel's experience or similar in a way to ancient Israel's experience of responsive forced migration, as has been described above, in which migrants voluntarily flee from tyranny, oppression, poverty, and other threats to their security. So as at 2017, the UN Population Division report estimates the number of international migrants worldwide at about 258 million. That is about 3% of the world's population. The UN Migration Data Portal reveals that there, are, or there were 1.3 million immigrants from Nigeria in 2017, representing 0.6% of the total migration population. The official records do not include those born of Nigeria or Nigerian parents in diaspora who hold citizenship of their birth countries. Unofficial reports state that there are about 15 million Nigerians in the diaspora. Within the embers of the unofficial reports has um, Ikuteijo has ascertained that young Nigerians make up the largest population of the growing flow of irregular migrants from Africa to developed countries. In 2016, for instance, more than 20,000 uh, migrants were involved in crossing of the Mediterranean Sea were reported to be from Nigeria. In addition, between 2017 till late 2019, hundreds of Nigerian migrants were deported from various destinations, including Italy, Libya, and South Africa. This young population undertake very risky journeys across the globe, and casualties continue to be on the increase on daily basis. <clears throat> the large number of migration from Nigeria explains the reason for the nations, for the nation accounting for the largest inflows of remittances into Africa in 2017, but dropped to second place behind Egypt in 2018. Nevin and Omosomi notes that in notes that in 2018, migrant remittances to Nigeria equaled 25 billion. US dollar, representing 6.1% of GPD or GDP, a figure that translates to 85% of the federal government budget in that year. The actual amount of remittance flow into the country is arguably higher if many of the unrecorded transactions that take place through irregular channels were recorded. However, the International Development Research Center 
report reveals that the African continent is losing the most important people it needs for social, economic, technical, and scientific development. Accordingly, Carrington, an economist at the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, Washington, has observed that over 3 million Nigerians are in the United States and Canada. He knows that, they, that people, rather than commodities, constitute the country's export of Nigeria, or the greatest export of Nigeria from which U.S. and other countries of the world profit. Carrington went on to describe Nigerians in the U.S. as accomplished immigrant group due to the fact that they excellently contribute to all sectors of the U.S. economy. He further states that Nigerians in diaspora are the most educated and talented black people to be found anywhere on earth and that they choose to remain in U.S., for instance, because of the fear of corruption and insecurity in the country. Adding weight to questions is the speech given by Obasanjo, former Nigerian president, at a gathering of Nigerian diaspora. He states, many of our best men and women for lack of opportunity and challenge at home have had to walk aside our shores. We should challenge them to return by putting in place the enabling government environment and the tools with which they will be able to give this country the full benefits of the education, training, and experience. The reasons for both regular and irregular migration are similar echoing the push factors inherent in the Nigerian society. The World, the World Poverty Clock in 2018 report reveals that Nigeria has more people living in extreme poverty than any other country in the world. The poverty rate goes in hand with the rate of unemployment as in the third quarter of 2016. The National Bureau of Statistics revealed that the overall unemployment rate has risen from 13.9% with the youth unemployment rate having risen to 25% from 24 in 2016. These economic trends, coupled with other variables, such as political instability and rising waves of conflict, higher wages in, in the destination country, career advancement and or training, access to the best facilities and technologies have led to the rising rate of migration from the country. Lessons from ancient Israel's experience. You have five minutes, ma'am. Yes, sir. International, international exposure with high sense of responsibility. Living in diaspora may pose cultural, food, clothing, religious life, and in integrity challenges as Daniel exemplifies. Yet Nigerians in diaspora can learn to be dependable, skilled in their work and work hard towards the development of their host nations. This will guarantee acceptability and a favorable grant to tap into the economic and political strengths of their host nations with the view of coming back to the country at the long run to contribute to the development of the country with the acquired skills. This idea should be incorporated in the National Orientation Agency campaign on migration. Secondly, is manpower development. Israel's experience echoes the fact that the wealth of a nation depends largely on the constitution of a man, uh, human resources. The demise of the best brands in ancient Israel leads to a disastrous fall of the nation. Inasmuch as Nigeria needs the high remittance flows from the world, more than that, she needs human beings with the needed skills to build the socioeconomic and political organizations for national development. Adeyeye posits that while capital and natural resources are passive factors of production, Human beings are the active agents who accumulate capital, exploit natural, natural resources, use social, economic, and political organizations, and carry forward national development. 
if human beings are not central to the growth of a nation, why is it that developed countries have very low remittance flows, yet very strong economies? The answer is simple. They have the needed skilled manpower for development. The mass exodus of the best brands from the country is already impeding the uh, growth of the nation's economy and needs to be checked as a matter of urgency. Social, pro uh, social protection policies. The patient edict of return could be viewed as a policy statement to end the ESA. Former President Oluse uh, Obasanjo, as we have noted above, has slightly stated as it has slightly stated that migrants should be challenged to return back to the country by putting in place the enabling environment or tools. The time to do that is now. The country should endeavor to control migration through policies that are human oriented, focused in terms of security of lives and property, economic and political stability, among others. The sociopolitical policies can be classified as one of such policies. By social protection policies, it implies all public please for time. I want to go to conclusion, please, for the reason of time. Under conclusion, this paper has demonstrated that ancient Israel's experience of Ezra provides helpful motives for which to develop a, the a theological perspective to contemporary migration challenge in Nigeria. Since this event mirrors the migration experience of underdeveloped countries in many ways, Israel's experience of Ezra agrees with the histo structure, historical structural theory anchoring largely on the dependency model that views migration not just as detrimental to the economies of the underdeveloped countries, but also as one of the very causes of underdevelopment rather than as a path towards development. The Ezra stripped ancient Israel of her best friends, thereby leaving the land desolate all through the period. However, the exiles made the most out of the period and thus were able or were instrumental for making Israel great again. Hence, for Israel, the Ezra was not a total disaster, or better put, a disaster that lasted only for some time until the people rose to the challenge of rebuilding the country. The study has shown that Nigeria is among the countries ranking high in migration figure and remittance flows. However, this is alarming as the nation has is steadily losing the human resources needed for development. Hence, the effects of the dependency model of historical structural theory. The nation can draw from the positive impact of the ESA on ancient Israel by re-strategizing through governance and governmental policies that are built towards making use of the current migration population as a tool for social, economic, and political development. Thus, there is need for the government to revisit the social protection policies, to widen the coverage, ensure proper funding and administration, rebuild people's trust and confidence in the government, eliminate corruption and guarantee the basic needs that are and guarantee that basic needs are met and subsequently also reduce the high levels of inequality. Above all, this might lead to uh, greater satisfaction and reduce the need and inclination to migration. Secondly, the Na National Orientation Agency should come up with campaigns that will prepare migrants to be their best in the host countries, as well as instilling them the yearning to contribute towards the development of their own country, for there is no place like home. Lastly, patriotism is highly needed if the nation must be great again. Those who have found the greener pasture overseas should not forget home. The government on her part should appreciate those who are here trying to make the country work by implementing policies that will relax the push factors for migration in Nigeria. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Zuma, for presenting and keeping to time.
uh, I'm going to remove you as a co-host, or perhaps I should just leave you. I can see Dr. Saibu raising up a hand. The instruction, I will take you uh, because you were so lucky that I, you're on the first screen. I did posted um, a chat that you should kindly type in there, but I saw two hands and I will, I will take the names down here. Uh, Professor Emerita Sogolo. Okay, let me check. And each one of you will have at least 20 seconds, please. Uh, my presentation, I will have a comment. Okay, oh, okay, Pro. We will start with uh, Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, uh, Almina Williams. Uh, let me see, where are you? Williams, Almina. I've asked you to unmute yourself. You have 20 seconds, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, let me commend the close on our first of all for the presentation. Uh, pro we've always um, hinted on this platform that the way PowerPoints are being designed, you know, it's always, it's going to cause quite a lot of uh, problem, particularly to presenters. So if we, if we adhere to some of the rules of how PowerPoints, that is too worded, that's one thing I've noticed. So she should take note of that. Uh, if, if a PowerPoint is too worded, the, the, the listeners will be bored because sometimes the valid points that are ex, you know, expected to be uh, marshaled or put forward will be lost. Secondly, I'm very concerned about uh, the mixed up uh, be, but between the abstract and the introduction of the work. Because I had expected that some of the issues raised in the abstract or issues raised in the in the introductory part of the PowerPoint should have been in the abstract because the abstract sends the entire message, particularly to the first uh, the, the, those who are in the, that's the first impression. So I, I think she should take a look at it. I'm also very concerned about uh, the concepts, conceptualization of concepts, exile and migration. And so so to a very large extent, the question now we need to ask is. What, where is the departure between exile and then migration? And then what is the nexus between the, the Israeli experience and Nigeria experience? Because these are two very different uh, areas. Or, you know, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. John Okpara Duru, I've asked you to unmute yourself. I think you are muted. 20 seconds. Yes, sir. Thank you, Prof. And other distinguished Prof. in the house. Um, Doctor, I want to thank uh, Dr. Zoma for her presentation, but at the same time, the first thing I wanted to say has been captured by Dr. Uh, Emina Williams, and uh, that is on the how worded the PowerPoint is. Then another comment I have is that uh, uh, Dr. DK read the work rather than talking to the paper. And uh, I don't think uh, in a scholastic um, uh, work like this, just reading through the, the lines. And, and, and I think that is why she was unable to, to finish most of the slides she has uh, already mapped out for, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rosemary Saibu, you are next, please. Good morning, House. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, my eminent professors, our grandfather in the in the house, Professor Sugolo, our father in the house, Professor Atijani. Though our neighbor vice chancellor may not be around, I want to commend uh, commend the effort of Dr. Uzoma Amos Dike for the work. The first point was what both uh, colleagues captured. So what there is, doesn't mean that you've not been attending the semi, this seminar because it has been corrected thanks to that number. If actually we've been participating, what has been corrected should not be. We're talking about reflection on Asian Israel continues. In, uh, in the first point, that is the second paragraph, you talked about, you, you wrote uh, kings, Collected, Elise, written, every, uh, and so so on, uh, but left the forest. That work collected is not good enough for this work. 
carried away. Uh -huh. The verb is not good enough. No, they are not inanimate. They are human beings. Carried away would, would be better. I want to commend you as well for your current uh, references. It was a very good work, but you did not, the PowerPoint make you not to be able to present it very well. That was a very good work. More grace to your elbow. Thank you, Prof, for the good work you're doing. You are making us to be active during the pandemic, uh, Director. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Professor Sogulo, I've asked you to unmute yourself, sir. All right. Uh, Sorry, sir. Unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Okay. I think good. I'm also. Are you hearing me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Director. Uh, First of all, I, I, I want to seek your permission to say something uh, which is beside the presentation just made. We, uh, in this platform, have become uh, a family rather than just an academic uh, community. And that is why I want to seize this opportunity to express my uh, very deep appreciation to uh, professor, uh, uh, well, you know, he prefers to be called Professor Adamu rather than Vice Chancellor. Otherwise, uh, in this context, I want to say it's the Vice Chancellor. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to him uh, for a very important thing which he has done, and which he, you know, a favor which he has done to many others. Uh, I belong to this uh, uh, platform. I belong to the university by virtue of my position as an emeritus professor. We are two, myself and Professor Olubbe Miro Jegeden. Um, that position is very important to me. And just recently, uh, Professor Damu played the role, which you know went beyond his being an erudite uh, uh, scholar, for which we know already. But as a human being, uh, you know, as a, as a human being, and, and I think it is important that, you know, when these things happen, we say them out and express our appreciation to him. The issue of our position, mine and that of Professor Jegede, came up for discussion. And he played a role, a very important role, which I want us, all of us, to appreciate because I'm sure he has done similar things to many of you. He has been very nice to me. He has made my stay in now uh, very, very uh, uh, valuable to me. So I just want to say thank you. Now, back to the paper. Uh, you see, why, when the presenter now said he was taking, after talking about the biblical experience, and he said he was now coming to Nigeria, I thought he was going to say something uh, historical about Nigeria in terms of migration, because apart from Nigerians moving out, all right, the colonial, uh, that is the colonial uh, uh, conquerors also moved into Nigeria. That too, historically, was a form of migration. Did we benefit from that, or was that a, a, a challenge to us? And I thought we, we need to mention that, that if you are really talking about uh, the historical perspective of migration, then when you come to Nigeria, also talk about the history of migration in Nigeria, not just Nigerians going out, but also our own experience with immigrants from outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Th thank you very much, sir. Uh, before you respond, uh, I uh, take uh, the next. Yes, sir. I, I've seen your hands, sir, Professor Adam. I'll call you later. Thank you, sir. Uh, before you respond, Dr. DK, or before, I would like to add my own comments uh, before I forget. Uh, I, I read your PowerPoint and I have 
uh, the same question as the first, second speakers. But without repeating it, I keep asking the question, uh, is it not better to have had two papers out of this? Because in your, history, in your uh, dissection of the contemporary and government response, particularly of Basanjo uh, period, alone is enough a paper that you can deeply look into. Uh, the issue of ancient Israelis uh, beyond singing the song by the riverside of Babylon uh, is also enough to, to, to stand on its own. And uh, within that context, I identify perhaps appropriately or not, it depends on your position, that Jeremiah 29 verse four fits into Joseph Ari's triadic relationship. You see, we have several concepts in, in diaspora studies. And one of it is the Joseph Ari's triadic relationship that wherever a migrant find himself or herself or a group, they try to recreate themselves. And I think when you cited Jeremiah 29.4, uh, it just came to me, you may want to look that up as you revise your paper. The last thing I want to say before I call on uh, Professor Abdallah Ubadamu is that uh, it, it, will, it will be nice to also have a representative of references as the last slide, okay? That is also part of you know, the structure that we, 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 we built. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go ahead and unmute. Um, uh, Professor Adamu, you've been asked to unmute, sir. Okay. Um, first Thank of you. Of you have morning, everyone. Um, uh, as for the old man, the grand old man, Professor Sogolo, and the others, um, it is a pleasure to do whatever I can in order to uh, see at least that people have a fair chance of life. And uh, I'm very happy when, when people were able to go beyond the station that they are. And uh, I just want you to remember me for what I did when I lived in Nineveh, because I saw Nineveh being mentioned today. <laughs> and uh, Nineveh is uh, the, the, you know, the assignment given to me, a reluctant assignment. You know, you know just, uh, I was asked to come here. I don't want to come here, but now that I'm almost finished, uh, so uh, I'm glad somebody at least will remember me for what I have done. Quite a few of the comments that have been made uh, are quite in order. Um, and l let me be very, very uh, frank. Those of us who have been in academic life for years have perfected a system. I've seen how the global best practices are when it comes to presentations and things like that. Nobody, absolutely nobody, cut and paste from their narrative paper into a PowerPoint slide. Nobody does that. Only in Nigeria and only by Nigeria. I've attended international conferences where Nigerians present papers and what all you see is what you have seen today. Pros and pros and pros with uh, references and uh, contextual background and all that. The idea is for us to have an idea of what you have said. You know, if you want to read it, give us the prose paper. But for PowerPoint, all we want are the main highlights it shouldn't be more than three, four, maximum five, six points on past slide where you summarize the concept. You have limited time. You are, you are even lucky you gave me 35 minutes. It meant I have attended a conference, international conference, in which you are given only five minutes. Five minutes. So what, what, what are you going to say in five minutes? Just your abstract. Read your abstract. End of discussion. So I, I think academicians in now need to really focus attention on how to make quality presentation so that we don't embarrass ourselves at international stages. They would be laughing at us behind our back. We wouldn't know that. I, I have seen that. So a, a, a situation like this uh, uh, where you just simply begin to cut and paste, cut and paste, show that you don't know how to use PowerPoint slides. That's okay. No problem. The first step to knowledge is ignorance. Once you don't know, then you now begin to say, how do I know? Uh, and therefore, I think there should be a need for, at, for, at one stage when things back to old normal when we can have to arrange a, 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 just a small session on PowerPoint presentations for most of our colleagues, because it's very clear. I have been seeing the trend. Uh, we have not uh, done, done that. Uh, Operado has already mentioned this. I just want to emphasize it. 
Now, I want to look at the culture. I'm not a, a Christian, I'm a Muslim, so I don't know all this historical stuff uh, that she's talking about, but I, I look at them from linguistic rather than re religious perspective. <clears throat> and also quite uh, a lot of what she has said is replicated in Islam, particularly your Old Testament, and uh, about this uh, idea of the Israelis moving away from Egypt and so on. So let me ask this conceptual question. The Israelis were not migrants in Egypt, or were they indigenous to Egypt? Because if you are forced to leave a place where you are and go back to where you think you are, it's not an exile. An exile is when you are banished from where you are. You are banished. You don't come back forever. Just like Sunni Salami, the Sunusi, he has been banished, not from Kano, but from the Emir of Kano, the throne that, that he has been banished from. And he can therefore be, 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 he can come in as a private citizen. The reason this can be done is because we are now operating a constitution that gives him the right to freedom of expression, right to freedom of movement, and so on. But before colonialism and before all this uh, 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 British uh, or parliamentary or British or American, whatever it is, he does not dare come back to the territory of Kano because they have been banished. So if you leave your country, to another place. You are not exiled. And the, the, the picture that she gave of Nebuchadnezzar or something like that, uh, permit me sir, to, to share my screen uh, to, to, to show you something that at least in Islamic, okay. in, in Northern Nigeria, yeah, in Northern Nigeria, we, we, ha we are very familiar with it. Just one second, sir. Uh, and, okay. Anybody you... who is my age okay. in, in, in the North, will be aware of, of, of this and um you are uh, the platform yeah. i know no 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 it's not a powerpoint that i'm looking at um no, you want to share something i want to share something but i can locate it yes i've made you a call so that you can do that yeah but uh, like i said i, I can't see it i i, I okay. can't see what i want i wanted to, to 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 do something but forget it anyway but uh, the idea is that there, there is this uh, picture of Nebuchadnezzar that is uh, drawn by William Blake, and that picture is that known is, is a person known as Mekilago. We believe that this guy resided in a particular stream in outside the immediate uh, city of Kano, and uh, it gave this impression that uh, 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 there is a link between uh, uh, Israelis, Babylonians, and Kano, which is rubbish. It's just a picture by William Blake uh, that was uh, was circulated as uh, uh, Mekilago. But the point, therefore, is, is, is that people who leave their environments are not exiles. And when they decide to come back, when the Israelis, after 40 years, decide to go back to Israel, mm -hmm. remember, they went back with a lot of wealth. They went back with a lot of gold, so much gold that according to the Islamic scripture, they, they actually melted part of their gold and created the calf and started worshiping it when Moses went to get, mm -hmm. get the commandments from God. So they, they had so much wealth, enough to set off a new life in a new land. And the fact that they have this uh, uh, belief that they have a land where they would, would, would belong to them indicates that they were not really exiles, but migrants, because they don't consider themselves indigenous to Egypt, but somehow they are the forced labor in Egypt. Uh, because that is what uh, 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 God's commandment to Moses is, that uh, people have been enslaved, and therefore the, the idea is to uh, free them. But back to Nigeria and her paper, as people have pointed out, she could have used the Biafra War as a typical example. Did Igbos migrate back to the East because of persecution in the Northern Nigerian uh, cities? Or did they exile themselves? Because my father was instrumental in the resettlement of Igbos when they came back. So you leave, when things are better, you come back. So where is your home? Is it Biafra that is your home or is it Kanu that is your home? So the, the, the lines between a migrant and an exile seem to have been blurred in her paper. And she did not give us a sufficient examples to show what, what cases of a mass exile is. I mean, the Igbos left Kanu in 1966 because, not because they were because they have been killed. So they migrated back to where they feel they are comfortable. Some of them were not even born in, in, uh, in, in Biafra land. Some were born in the north, but they decided to move because that is their, their ancestral home. After the war, what happened? Instead of staying, they returned back. So they do have now, are now they exiles from Biafra. 
So, or are they just migrants? And I, so I, I think there is a, a, a improper contextualization of the difference between an exile and a, a migrant. And uh, if she's to present this at an international forum, Nawao, they go scatter and go. So it's, it's good that we do the internal scattering here, the internal critique before you begin to, to, to think about it. And I, I mentioned this because sooner or later she will start asking for professorship, sooner or later. And uh, the way things are moving in the university with the effect of from 2020 promotions exercises, that is anybody who is uh, to be promoted in uh, 2020 January, there is a new rule, new condition that have been set up. And scholarship is, is, is one of them. International scholarship is one of them. So please, please, my people, you know, I'm living in 156 days uh, from now. I keep counting every day. And, uh, but I, I want to leave uh, uh, you with the feeling that you really need to make yourself amenable to international scrutiny, international acceptance, and so on. So uh, paper, the paper, to be honestly frank with you, like uh, Oparadu said, is too wordy. It has a lot of uh, stuff uh, inside. Uh, it mixes up a lot of concepts between exile and migration. Did not give sufficient examples, like the IDP in, in Borno, in the Northeast. Is that exile or migration? I mean, you are forced to walk. Why? What is exile? So that there are improper conceptual definitions. So I would have loved her to, 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 to leave the biblical and the religious and theological arguments and focus on the, the human aspect, the, the intellectual aspect of the difference between exile and migration. And just use biblical, uh, uh, you know, contemporary issues, ex illustrations, rather than, you know, uh, taking us through a, a Sunday class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adamo, uh, for that uh, <clears throat> comment. I think I will allow the presenter to rest. The six comments uh, as you deem fit. Dr. Dike, you have the version. Thank you very much, Prof. And the uh, distinguished uh, professors and the uh, VC and all of you are uh, my colleagues, senior colleagues and the rest. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate all. I'm sorry about the PowerPoint presentation. I'm just I'm very sorry about that. On the issue of exile, whether exile is uh, um, banishment, I researched and I presented the um, description or meaning of exile in the paper. Exile describes a situation where somebody is forced to leave he is forced to live as a result of war or enslavement. And that was what happened in Israel in the period under uh, review. These people were deported. They were taken away from their place to another place because they were conquered. They became a conquered people and they were exiled. And I described mm -hmm. aspects or categories of exile, which fits into migration, especially uh, re responsive mind, uh, or responsive um, exile or response which which correspond with vo involuntary migration there is involuntary in migration there is voluntary and involuntary and as I fit into the involuntary aspect of migration where people are under pressure to live because the the home front is not conducive for them to stay. This becomes migration. And this is an aspect of exile too. In exile, or somebody is forced to, is under pressure to leave, is either deported as we see in the case of Israel, or forced to leave his or her homeland. And is not willing to come back until the situation that made him to go or to leave is stabilized. This is the case. I am thinking of Nigeria, not an ethnic group in Nigeria. I am thinking of Nigeria in the international world. I am looking at international migration and I specified it in the paper. It's not about internal migration, it's about international migration because Israel's case was international. 
Nigeria case, as I cited, uh, it, uh, case is international too. How people are leaving the country and what Nigeria is already gaining because of the people that are leaving, the remittance flow. And I said, this is okay, but it's not enough because this manpower that are responsible for the uh, remittance flow can be here to develop the country can contribute to the development of the country because manpower is needed if the country must be developed. We need manpower more than we need the money. And I cited the instance that other countries, other developed countries are very low in remittance flow. They are not getting much in remittance flow. Yet Nigeria and other underdeveloped countries are getting much, yet our economy is dying on a daily basis. What we need is not this money. What we need more than the money is human human power, manpower to develop the economy. Then on the aspect of the word use, collected or carried away, please I am citing, and it's not only human beings that were taken, there were also other items from the temple. And I am citing from Bible, how the, the, ref, the Bible passage puts it. That is how I reference it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your response. Um, let me make the following um, <clears throat> announcement before we, we round up. Uh, I want to thank, um, this time around, I'm referring to the Vice Chancellor, Prop, uh, Professor Adamo. And uh, while he was speaking, I was taking a note and I put down here, first week November, making quality presentations, a quality assured, a kind of roundtable. Uh, I will be giving you my information before first week, uh, first uh, Monday in November. <clears throat> I think uh, we need to focus on that and I thank the, the uh, Vice Chancellor, not Professor Adam, I thank him in both capacity for, for really drawing our attention to that. Uh, indeed, without sounding political because it's a very uh, special uh, months and days at now. And without sounding political, I hope nobody's reading any meanings to it. I can tell you that you've made a mark <clears throat> that the, the setting up of this center, uh, you, you did it. You have latitude to take the initial fund from tech fund and uh, just spend it the way you want and put it somewhere else and then you said this uh, is what you want to do and you give us the latitude to to do this even under covid while other universities were sleeping we were up and running and uh, intellectually stimulating ourselves and i think it has been a priceless opportunity that you've created for us to to challenge our intellectual capacity and therefore all that you've, uh, you've approved. Let me also say this, that the, the proposed journal uh, is, is an international way, and it will be. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Council also suggested some names, and uh, by God's grace, and luckily, you know, somebody that is so revered globally when it comes to global studies, diaspora studies, uh, at the University of Prague, and who is also the current director of, uh, global, uh, of uh, Diaspora and Global Studies, has agreed to be on our editorial team. So your paper is not subject to Tijani's witches. Thank you, sir, for the clapping. It's not Tijani, so when it's, re it's peer reviewed and then it's accepted, don't thank me. <laughs> you thank yourself for doing the job and the vice chancellor for admonishing us. I must tell you a secret. Somebody presented, an extra person from Unilag presented in uh, some few weeks back, and he called me immediately, and he said he's so appreciative of the fact that, you know, the, the vice chancellor was there, that he got a very useful comment that has really raised his thinking and his intellectual uh, disposition to issues. So we thank you, sir. Uh, lastly, we've also had, you know, I, I can tell you that apart from the, the gentleman's Prague, 
We have somebody from West Indies also who has uh, secretly been with us, along with his uh, mentees, his postgraduate students. Uh, I won't mention their names, you will see their names. And of course, in at the University of Ibadan, someone also had to, to be on the editorial board. Uh, the VC has been pushing this, and uh, despite our challenges, we've been able to get to this. So I thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you as usual. Uh, when the governor of the central bank uh, approved, the society shall elect a general secretary who can read and write to take charge of the secretariat. You see, that is what happens when you allow people and there's somebody is uh, talking about electing secretary. Well, I'll just mute everyone until we finish. Uh, I just want to thank you most sincerely. And then next week is another date. Uh, we appreciate you and stay blessed. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.